Thank you. First purple hurdle, you made it up onto the stage. That's that's the band. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. We're both really pleased to be here today to talk to you on Team of Legacy. Um, thank you for inviting us. Um, and this is a tricky thing to talk about, obviously, because our profession is a multifaceted beast, as we're all well aware. And despite what non-members of the profession might think, there's a multiplicity of interests and viewpoints represented even in within a relatively small occupation like ours. So establishing what a communal legacy might be is a tricky ask. So Caroline and I decided instead to go about this from the perspective of an enabling legacy and how to achieve what we think we might want to lead to future generations, whether they be fellow archaeologists or the recipients of the benefits our work leaves behind. Sometimes the opportunity for reflection on legacy actually provides the space for planning, which is crucial for legacy, as we will see. First, we know a bit of context. So I, um, I'm Stephanie Watson, I think I'll introduce myself, sorry. And I, I'm a research fellow based at Mould in London, and I've been funded for the last few years by UKRI, United Kingdom Research Innovation, which is actually you as UK taxpayers, so thank you everyone. So think about the public benefit, also known in the constructive sector, of course, of social value, um, how to maximise the work that we do and um, social value providing a pretty developer funded archaeology. And I've spoken to many of you over the years, with Caroline being a particularly important ally, providing a different but aligned perspective. My career, and there are lots of you, my first supervisor is actually in the room, I'll be speaking to him at T Road. Um, has been entirely formed through the developer funded sector since the mid 90s. I have a contractor's mindset. The client has always been my customer, and public benefit was, has traditionally been provided in that context by engagement, largely passive on the part of the invited communities. Thankfully, as we all know, this is changing quite rapidly with an awareness at all levels that we need to better reflect the needs of the communities that we work alongside and within. The challenge, of course, is how to do this, as the precise benefits that people want and need will be highly context-dependent, as is archaeology, of course, and will almost certainly not match what we think and require some brave decisions. And the challenge, of course, is whether we will have been good ancestors. The slide here shows London, where I live and work, in 2100. As predicted from climate modelling, um, done by Environment Agency, therefore, and the London City Policy Unit, by which time four of the World Heritage Sites will be underwater, unless we raise our defences, and in London the defence is, of course, on the Thames River Wall. So, the London that my grandchildren, if such people exist, will not be the same London as I see, um, and the same London that my grandparents saw. We won't be able to see the Thames from, from the banks, it'll be behind walls that are three metres high. So we won't be able to view legacy in the same way that previous generations have viewed it. We're looking at a whole new ball game for the 21st century. Thankfully, we have tools at our disposal to save off the existential dread that that previous slide might have intended. And archaeologists, of course, we think about legacy all the time, as previous speakers Kate Tilly has said, as we're professionally obligated to do this, to plan for legacy in terms of preserving, conserving and recording the historic environment but also in terms of developing our fellow professionals within robust, hopefully, business models and ensuring a quality service for clients to encourage repeat commissioning. Some of the legacy we provide will be mandated in the form of archives, grade literature, publication, and of course, um, the persistent preservation in situ. Um, but the legacy needs to be expanded beyond these to be more outcome driven, to be people focused, and to be aimed at what creates the greatest value. And as I said before, this, these might not be the mandated things, despite how preciously we hold these things as professionals. So there are many ways to make this kind of abstract, unmandated things more visible. Now, systems we can use to create these pathways can then see. I've only got two examples on the slide. Five ways to well-being is shown in the bottom left. Formulated by the NHS, widely used in the health and social care systems, um, and of course increasingly used wonderfully now in archaeology and heritage. The workplace wellbeing model, I won't need any introduction here because we're all archaeologists and I'm fully aware that we all have these in practice in our organisations currently. But I just wanted to remind us that um, legacy, of course, is internal as well. So we need to think about how we provide legacy for our own colleagues as well, as legacy moves in all directions, of course. But it also needs 
We also need to ensure that the legacy we provide is accessible. And we can't decide on behalf of anybody else what legacy they will want to be left holding, but we can ask them. So just a couple of brief examples from my own work. Um, one on the left is from research-funded consultations and activities based on archaeology. We asked locals around our offices in London, Laura Peckney, um, what they thought they might want from archaeology funded through development. Um, and this cost, uh, this consultation cost about £20,000. And this consultation grew, blossomed, I should say, into the Roman Gardens of Londinium project on the right, which had a tiny budget of £5,000, graciously donated to us by our local archaeological society, the Roman Middlesex Archaeological Society, still ongoing with a hardcore of Hackney locals. They were now encouraging us to apply for different types of funding, so infrastructure, community level funding. And as an aside, one of the main bits of research that, that the participants used was a paper written by an up-and-coming archaeologist, you see, may have heard of called Peter Hinton. I'm trying to do very well in archaeology. <laughs> but the key to this is that these were both listening projects, um, and the legacy is not being decided by me. One very specific direction legacy travels in for us is towards the people who commission us, though, and I don't think we need to be shy about this. We operate as enablers in development, of course, and so need to be providing notices that the construction sector recognise, appreciate, and can respond well to. They already have lots of models for social housing, for other types of housing, for larger construction projects, for publicly funded, privately funded, MPF, nationally significant infrastructure projects. And we need to be better at fitting our outcome studies. Archaeology sits in a brilliant position to be able to respond to all these frameworks that are already in existence. We just need to work out how best to do it. And the best way to do that, of course, is to talk to our construction sector colleagues, which is how Caroline and I got together and sat down with other colleagues and started to collaborate. And at which point, I'll hand those again. Thank you, Katie. <coughs> So, my name is Caroline Reno. I work for Spain and a contract lead um, on major infrastructure projects. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about my with work with Merlin. Um, so, by the very nature of project, there's always going to be a big beginning, a middle, and an end, and therefore the consideration of legacy is a significant part of that delivery is often the ultimate measure of success. But it needs to be planned in at the front end and the design stage. It doesn't just happen organically. Um, and we need to measure the outcomes. Archaeological projects often um, basically focus on or result in the removal of a site, artifacts, or significant features in the landscape. So the resulting legacy is actually often an absence of some kind which can manifest itself in a sense of loss, as often wider communities only become aware of an archaeological site or find once it's been excavated as part of construction activity or major projects. Recording and reporting are increasingly bolstered, of course, by the implementation of new technologies that we have access to. Our biological data still has limitations um, in the way that it's stored, the way that it's accessed, distributed, and presented. Archaeology is not always accessible to all, despite less impaired. A recent and positive legacy of previous projects has been a new collaborative relationship with Sadie Watson and Kate Fashion. Um, we've been able to come together to review our respective thinking around social value in a balanced way, which reflects both the archaeological perspective and the perspective of a tier one contractor in Costain. And this has been incredibly valuable as an activity for both organisations as it elevates our shared knowledge and brings parity in terms of language, process and expectations as we embark on delivery. <laughs> So Costa and Mova have recently worked together to address the challenge of integrating social benefits and legacy into construction project life cycles. When we first started to talk about this, we realised there were great similarities in our processes, and we sought to marry them together in a way which is clear and easy to understand. The process and the outcome of this collaboration was published in the Institution of Environmental Management and Assessment, IEMA. Uh, and it includes this useful graphic, which I'm showing uh, here on the right of the slide. And um, this is effectively a visual culmination of our approach. It shows the archaeological process of delivering social value outcomes aligned against the processes followed by construction professionals to deliver social value on major projects. The aspiration is that this can be used by anyone just to access it.
to support the defining and delivery of social value and legacy on projects and to help eliminate barriers to understanding when communicating with clients in other sectors. It was developed by Costain and Mola, but it's free to be used by everybody. And you can download the article um, from the IEMA website as well. That's free to access. So you can take that graphic and use it if you wish to. Now, I say major projects, but we're aware that a huge amount of significant archaeological work is carried out across the UK outside of this envelope. So most importantly, this approach can be adapted. It is scalable uh, and it can be used to support projects of all sizes and through different types of project life cycle. Obviously, this new Syria guide on archaeology and construction nicely sets out the different uh, types of project life cycle that you may be engaged in. The quadrants of the aligned social value process also link back to the principles and duties set out by CIFA, and which are relevant to all members and member organisations. We also considered what basic requirements would need to be met to ensure a standard of legacy outputs. And we would encourage everyone to ask themselves these four key questions when building their legacy programme to support an effective outcome. So the four prompts or questions are, Is it measurable? How are you measuring the success of your legacy project, starting with the design phase and moving on into delivery and handover? And how will you know what you've achieved and that you achieved what you set out to deliver? By establishing clear metrics, you can start to monitor and evidence success and all the different values that social value brings, economic and to the community as a whole. These should be agreed with your client or employer so they understand what the aim and the objective is. And this will also help to validate the social value and legacy aspect where social value is often asked for to contribute to a client KPI. Is it visible and is it accessible? Now I say visible here, but I'm aware that there are multiple senses and we can integrate and access all of those to understand our wider environment. Um, so this could also be interchangeable with a tangible as well, I think. Um, but can your legacy outcome be seen and understood by the community, either as a series of processes or as an outcome or a product? And can your client see and understand it at the most basic level? In terms of accessibility, can it be accessed by the whole potential audience or does it introduce barriers which may limit the participation, interpretation or appreciation of a legacy by discrete groups? And finally, is it repeatable? We invest a huge amount of time in creating new ideas and processes for delivering social value as part of our work, both in the construction sector and in the archaeology and heritage sectors. Um, but by considering an approach which is repeatable, you will move social value to a tried and tested business as usual space um, with a body of data which can be used to demonstrate to the client the efficacy and value. So our, our brief takeaway and summary is to uh, please do check out our social value process and the IEMA article and consider if your social value legacy is in fact measurable, visible, accessible and repeatable because those four elements can help set you on a standardised path and a road to success. Um, so by considering the measurable, visible and accessible and repeatable elements and applying the process as part of your social value toolkit, the intent is that it will support effective decision making and eliminate some of the traditional challenges that we face in this delivery space. Thank you.